Hello, I'm Linda Yu, and I'm delighted to host this debate, Knowledge versus Creativity. From the development of a successful COVID vaccine to the formulation of a new scientific theory, from the composition of a great opera to the making of an award-winning movie, we prize creativity and celebrate its products. Yet, in our education system and in our exams, creativity is largely excised. And in working life, carrying out a task accurately and efficiently is the primary focus. Are we right to focus on learning knowledge and experience, or should we give greater emphasis to creativity in all of its many forms and encourage new solutions and new ways of operating? But is creativity only possible when the hard work of learning the rules has been achieved? More fundamentally, is creativity itself unfathomable and impossible to teach and limited to those with exceptional talents? To debate all of this, I'm joined by a lovely expert panel. Lisa Feldman Barrett is a Northeastern University Distinguished Professor and among the top 1% most cited scientists in the world for her revolutionary research in psychology and neuroscience. She is author of the best-selling books, Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain and How Emotions Are Made. Jesse Norman is a politician and philosopher. In his day job, he is financial secretary to the treasury. In his spare time, he is a biographer of Adam Smith and Edmund Burke and has written highly successful and interesting books on each of these figures. And Tripali Patel is director of Story Lab, a multi-award winning Cambridge-based research institute that experiments and interrogates narrative form and function to create powerful and purposeful films. She is director at Eyeline Films, a BAFTA award-winning production company. She's also part of a radical higher education project, the New School of the Anthropocene. Welcome to all of you. Each panelist now has three minutes to put forward their view, their pitch on this question that we're all here to debate today, which is, are we right to value knowledge over creativity? Lisa Feldman Barrett. Thank you so much. And thank you for including me in this event. Um, I guess from the perspective of neuroscience, I would say this is an ill-posed question because um, under the hood, you know, in terms of what our brains are doing, uh, there was tremendous dependency uh, between knowledge and and creativity. So for example, the way your brain works is it takes what you know and combines it in novel ways uh, in order for you to recognize things that you've never seen before. So when you see a flight of stairs that you've never encountered before, how do you know that it's a flight of stairs? How do you know how to walk up that flight of stairs? How do you understand the metaphor of a social ladder or a, you know, a, 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 a hierarchy um, that um, implies um, walking, you know, climbing um, a ladder or stairs. The way that you that you understand these things is by something called conceptual combination, where your brain takes bits and pieces of knowledge and combines them in novel ways. Um, so that's a form of creativity. So basically, the way knowledge manifests itself in your brain is as creativity. And similarly, uh, in order to be creative in the conventional sense, as you pointed out, Linda, um, we need to have knowledge. And I would, you know, point people to what I call the Picasso principle, which is Picasso, before he was able to invent cubism, actually learned the tools and, and um, skills as a classical uh, painter, consider his blue period, for example. The only way that he was able to, um, you know, invent, discover, creatively emerge, um, uh, creatively um, uh, a form uh, a new school of painting is because he was he had a, no a lot of knowledge um, being classically trained. And I guess the final thing I will say is that creativity, the way it's defined, in, is the um, use of imagination to create original ideas. So it's basically imagination. The basis of imagination is what we know. This this is what neuroscience tells us. The things that we imagine are just creative combinations of the things that we already know. And creativity is a skill that is, that is learnable. Um, uh, and that's actually, skills that are learnable are actually called procedural knowledge in, in psychology and in neuroscience. So I would say 
you know, the there's an interesting discussion here to be had, but I think, you know, po opposing these or, you know, co comparing these or setting them up as in opposition to each other, I think is, um, at least from a scientific perspective, not not the way that I would phrase the question. Thank you very much. Um, Jesse Norman, same question to you. Are we right to value knowledge over creativity? Uh, I, of course, I agree with Lisa that the question is ill posed because there is no direct conflict between the idea of creativity and knowledge. But I, I would go further to say that it, it should be obvious on reflection that uh, not only does the Picasso principle apply, but they're really, uh, it, it, we can tell ourselves a story and it may be morally uplifting. It may be the re result of a romantic uh, revolution in our thinking in the early 18th century, where we started to privilege the idea of the lone and solitary genius uh, on a mountaintop uh, viewing the heavens. Uh, but of course, there really is very, very little blank slate, as you might say, creativity. And a lot of the examples that you might think of as blank slate creativity come really from two things. One is that the person who is regarded as the great creative genius is, and of course it is often a story about individual achievement, whereas much creativity is a story about collective achievement, um, uh, is, is, is something that comes because the person has just slightly ahead of a peer group. And of course it's famously true that genius has no peer, direct peer group to assess its, uh, its, um, uh, effects and its impact. Um, but there's another thing going on here, I think, which is that, of course, genuine creativity requires not just practice and expertise, but a kind of immersion in a, in a framework of rules. And uh, indeed, I would argue a, a traditional set of traditions. And, and you see this everywhere. Um, uh, and uh, because there's one example, Mozart's another example. I mean, do, do people really think that Mozart um, was the sublime genius he was, as it were, just because of some godlike capacity? They did at the time. He undoubtedly was an astonishing uh, processor and creative innovator, but he did so on the basis of materials. What were those materials? Well, the works of C.P.E. Bach, the works of Gluck, the works of uh, uh, Handel, the works of preeminently of Haydn. I mean, you can see his work coming out of that. And in a funny way, uh, you know, even though Beethoven, in some respects, is seen as an even greater innovator, he, in a way, is doing the same thing uh, as well. So that the question then is, is that does that mean there's no scope for genuine radicalism? And and the answer, I think, is is no. And what you see is, in a way, an extension of what Lisa described, which is the the act of creativity is lifting a set of rules from one place and then applying them somewhere else. And a great example there, I, I used to teach the philosophy of maths, and a great example of that would be someone like Gauss and the invention of non-Euclidean geometries. So what does Gauss do? Gauss asks himself the question, well, I have this flat space geometry that we get from the ancient Greeks and Euclid, but actually there's something odd about this because one of the key elements of it, the so-called parallel postulate, has never been proved what happens if we varied that? What would we get if we varied that? And then he discovers that we would get curved space and then sets out the mathematics of curved space. That's an incredibly innovative and incredible uh, and thoughtful achievement. And then, of course, Einstein then does the same thing in physics and says, well, what would happen if space itself, not just its mathematical description, but safe itself, space itself were differently shaped? And you get the application of non-Euclidean geometries in uh, and, the, and therefore the extension of the belief that space itself might be curved and that in turn leads to theories of gravity and, and the like. So um, I think it is possible to tell a story which combines the sense of shock and amazement we have when we see these things for the first time and yet to fit them into an intelligible uh, tradition of, of creative elaboration and uh, imaginative adventure. Thank you very much. Um, same question to you, Sripali Patel. Are we right to value knowledge over creativity? Well, I think I need to preface this with um, two things. One, I'm not sure how much of a debate we'll have because I agree with Jesse and I agree with Lisa. You know, <laughs> I don't think these are diametrically opposite. And secondly, I, I actually took the approach of um, defense as a creative. I, I came in here ready to, to have a bit of a battle and a bit of a fight. So I prepared a defense and I'm thinking, do I just throw this out? So my script is out virtually completely. Yeah, I would agree that both knowledge and creativity are intangible concepts and not mutually exclusive. 
The act of creating itself generates both tacit and explicit knowledge and facilitates a bi-directional knowledge exchange. Forgive the language that I use, I've just come out of something called the ref in academia. Um, the creative practice itself often embraces a speculative design process. Now, I've embraced the term speculative design, but it very much goes back to what Jesse was saying, which was about the what if principle, this idea of experimentation, what if, um, which involves conceptualization, ideation, experimentation, testing, evaluation, critical reflection, and often produces an output, whether it's film, music, dance, books, clothes, and even furniture and houses. So the outputs are immense. But I think what's important to note, and, and this may prove an element of conversation here, is um, that creative outputs can generate um, understanding, empathy, and provoke emotion and action, um, and action in the audience or user. So that idea of the emotional interplay with creativity and what it provokes I think is, is really quite interesting. So when we talk about knowledge, are we talking about explicit codified knowledge or tacit knowledge, which is intuitive, rooted in context and experience, which is often hard to communicate and often resides in the mind of the practitioner? I would argue that codified knowledge can be quantified and fed into data research more easily than the qualitative nature of tacit knowledge. So again, another important note I, I feel to highlight here is that the function of the lived experience in the creative process and output is very important. Um, so the question of value, um, I came up with lots of figures. Um, we, we know in the UK that the OFS um, are proposing to defund the arts subjects by 50% in the UK. Um, and uh, though the, the proposal recognised the cultural importance and enrichment of the arts in society, there was a considerable absence of acknowledgement that the creative critical thinking, innovation and practice of creative disciplines fuel one of the largest contributions to the UK GDP. So 117 billion in 2018, equivalent to 306 million a day, with an average sector growth of 7.4% a year. Um, these figures were generated by the DCMS um, in February 2020. Um, and those figures can be broken down further with the cultural sector contributing 32.3 billion to the economy with a growth, growth rate of 2.7%. Um, and the digital sector, um, 149 billion, 7.7% of the UK economy with a year on growth of 7.9%, which will be interesting to have a look at for this year during the pandemic, just to see what that growth is. So just to conclude, I would ask, similar to my colleagues here, um, why are we positioning knowledge against creativity and what purpose does it serve to not acknowledge the implicit relationship between creativity and knowledge generation? Thank you very much, Rapali. That's really interesting. I want to come back to that in terms of our school curriculum um, in a moment. But I think first, um, you know, I think all of you um, have, dis have discussed and largely agreed on the value of, uh, of creativity. So... To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.